sons of men, daughters of the mingled lovers of the many tribes who make us what we are, brothers, sisters by the millions, sitting with us at this table, encircled round us through the far wide-spreading states. What year this is, we shall not soon forget. Remark it, each of you belonging to it, this year shall skulk among the blackest annals ever. Through a series of serendipities, somebody at CB has heard me and thought uh, that I would be an interesting addition to their staff. They engaged me as a director, not knowing that I, my chief interest was writing. And so I parlayed those mm -hmm. talents and became uh, my own producer as well. And in very short time, I was able to latch on to some opportunities that found my programs getting attention in the national publications, Time and other magazines, and there I was on my way. Norman Corwin was hired by CBS in April of 1938 as a director. For the next three years, he honed his craft on shows like Words Without Music, The Pursuit of Happiness, So This Is Radio, and Forecast, until 1941 when he was given the task of taking over the famed Columbia Workshop for 26 weeks. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor and Manila on December 7, 1941, at the behest of President Roosevelt, Corwin penned a 60-minute play in honor of the 150th anniversary of the Bill of Rights. Entitled, We Hold These Truths, it was broadcast on December 15th and simultaneously heard on all four major radio networks. 60 million people tuned in. It was at that time the largest rating share of any dramatic program in the history of broadcasting. The next year, Corwin and Edward R. Murrow combined to produce An American in England on CBS. Corwin intentionally avoided interviewing government officials, choosing instead to focus on everyday people and how they were affected by the war. He made weekly reports from England via shortwave between August 3rd and September 7th. You find that the Yanks and their allies are picking up each other's language and learning each other's customs. This comes from crowding the same pubs, palling around in the airdromes, flying together, bumping into each other in the Strand and Trafalgar Square at country dances. It's not uncommon to hear a Tommy say, What's cooking, old boy? At the outset of his career at CBS, Corbin was fortunate enough to receive name billing on Words Without Music at the behest of a CBS vice president named William Lewis. From then on, many of Corbin's shows had his name attached to them in the title. The name billing was tremendous. From there on, it became mm -hmm. the following series was 26 by Corwin, and mm -hmm. then there was Columbia Presents Corwin, and there were two of those. By 1944, at only 33 years old, Corwin had free creative reign over his productions. On March 7th of that year, Columbia Presents Corwin debuted on CBS. The show was not offered by CBS to sponsors. It was considered the crown jewel in the CBS lineup. The network purposefully broadcast it for free. Corwin had a knack for getting to the heart of a social or political issue. Rather than dumb down his subjects, he built up mental stimulation in his audience, bringing out the truth in the human condition and invoking true emotion and self-reflection from listeners. By the spring of 1944, the frailty of the human condition was one the entire world had been facing head-on for quite some time. This is Robert St. John in the NBC newsroom in New York. Ladies and gentlemen, we may be approaching a fateful hour. All night long, bulletins have been pouring in from Berlin, claiming that D-Day is here, claiming that the invasion of Western Europe has begun. Uh, let me read you several of the latest bulletins. One says that a report unconfirmed by a lie... Early on the morning of June 6, 1944, word began to spread that an Allied invasion of the beaches of Normandy and France had begun. All four major networks sprung into action. At 2.30 a.m., NBC was put on a flash news basis, and their usual trademark GEC chime notes were expanded using a fourth chime, GECC. This alert called all newsmen and commentators to their microphones and called all key operating personnel to their stations. Minutes after the fourth chime sounded, NBC newsman Robert St. John made the announcement in their New York newsroom. Operation D-Day was underway. Well, I presume that means wiped out by the Allies. Uh, as you may have heard on earlier broadcasts, all three German news agencies 
have begun broadcasting uh, these stories that the invasion is here. But there is no allied confirmation as yet. The Normandy invasion was a tremendous success, opening up a second European front and forcing the Nazi army to fight both to its west and to its east. In a war filled with an incredible amount of serious moments, back home in the United States, June 6, 1944, and each successive day after, were the most serious of all. It's high noon in New York and time for Kate Smith. Hello, everybody. The people of the United States preferred to take D-Day seriously and prayerfully. There was no confetti, no wild demonstrations. Instead, thousands of Americans responded to the good news in a much finer and better way. Throughout the country, they trooped to blood donor stations and war bond booths. War bond sales increased. Payroll offices of factories were swamped with bond buyers. Some cities started their fifth war loan drive early and have already sold their quotas. Yes, Americans are rallying behind our gallant armies of liberation storming Fortress Europe. But don't forget for one moment that the war is far from won. So here on the home front this noon, let's renew our determination to do everything we can to speed the day of victory for our fighting men. And now, Ted, what's new? The Allied Army of... Hello, Ted. That operator? All right, wait a minute now. Here's the 20 cents. Hello, Pa? This is Eddie. I'm at camp. I say I'm at the camp. Yeah. I've been waiting in line two hours to make this call, Pa. Huh? I'm fine, Pa. How are you? Am I okay and Beanie? Ah, oh, that's good. Look, Pa, listen. Here's why I'm calling. I'm going to be home over the 4th. Yeah. Two-day pass. No, 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 no. By train. I'll get in around dinner time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, Pa, a lot of guys are waiting to make calls, so I better hang up. Uh-huh. Okay, I see you Monday night. Bye. Less than a month after D-Day on Independence Day in 1944 at 10 p.m., Columbia Presents Corwin, broadcast a play entitled, Home for the Fourth. Columbia presents Corwin. In this play, two brothers, Eddie and Jim, are away at war. One, Eddie, voiced by Dane Clark, gets a two-day pass for an Independence Day visit home to see his family and his girlfriend, Rita. When he gets home, Eddie, his parents, and his kid sister share a dinner together as a family. Eddie's father has been waiting for an important telegram all day. A sergeant. Oh, Eddie. <laughs> Incidentally, Eddie, I, I met Bill Gargan today. Oh, how is Bill? Oh, he's fine. He's lieutenant. Got ten days spell before going overseas. Says he might drop in to dinner. Good. I'd like to see him. Hmm. Uh, when are you going to see Rita? Hmm. Well, she doesn't get off work till eight, and then she's coming over. Oh. Aren't you married, Rita? I would if I were. Ma, would you sit down? I'll bring him. Hello, you. Rita. You're looking well, Edward. So are you. Ask me in, darling. Oh, come here. You're full of lipstick. It's all right. Mark of honor. Here's my handkerchief. All off? Yes. Let's go inside. Rita and Eddie talk of marriage, and he loves her, but he's hesitant. He asks her to wait until the war is over. Later, the pair come outside to hear Eddie's parents having an animated discussion with a neighbor and friend named Bill Gargan, who's also home on leave. They're discussing the merits of idealism in a tear and conference. We figured the folks must be back in their walk, so we went out and we joined them. They were talking with Bill Gargans, who'd met them on their way up the street. Pa was deep in an argument with Bill. I know what I'm talking about, Bill. I fought in the last one. It was the same thing then. He said it was a war to end war, and so on and so forth, but it wasn't anything of the kind. It's the same thing today, all over again. Well, I disagree with you, Mr. Eakin. It's an entirely different war. In, in, in the first place... What's going on here? 
Well, hello, Eddie. Hello, how are you? Fine, I'm good. You know Rita, don't you? Yes, of course. How are you, dear? What are you doing? I'm working in a machine and tool factory now. Oh, good. Don't let us interrupt this dog fight. Carry on, gentlemen. Oh, well, we weren't arguing. It's just that Bill here seems to think he can change human nature. No. No, I don't believe that's an issue at all, Mr. Eakin. If, uh, if anything, in, uh, people's instincts are against war. Was it human nature that got Ed and me into uniform? No, it was draft board number 17. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it wasn't human nature. It was a very inhuman, unnatural thing. Like what? It was fascism, Ed. That's right, Bill. Why, sure. After all, uh, peace. And not war is so much a part of human nature that, well, most of us just refuse to believe that the fascists deliberately intended to make war. And we waited until it was almost too late. I still think we're going to have another war after this one. And so do I. Oh, Eddie, you don't. Sure I do. That's defeatist talk, if you ask me. Mr. Eakins, you mean you don't think anybody will have learned Anything out of this war? No, I think it's exactly the same kind of war as the last one. Absolutely, I agree with my old man. Well, your old lady doesn't agree with your old man. I think we've made a lot of progress. Good for you. Such as what? Well, the Atlantic Charter and the Tehran Conference. I and... bet you don't even know what they stand for. How much do you want to bet, oh, hmm? Oh, never mind, never mind. When you talk that way, you probably know. Well, no, what do they stand for? The Tehran Agreement called for the big three to continue cooperating after the war. Well, I ought to know that when I lectured to the East Side Women's Club about it. It says that Britain, Russia, and we are planning for the day when all the people in the world can live free lives. Free from tyranny and, uh, well, if I remember the wording, uh, according to each one's varying desires and uh, his own conscience. Isn't that right, Mrs. Eaton? Correct. Oh, that all sounds fine, but when I tell you it's idealistic, it's, it's visionary. Well, what do you think? Look, none of the boys, Bill, that I know in the Army go for that idealism stuff, at least not in my outfit. Well, they do in my outfit. Listen, Bill, I've talked with a lot of the boys, including some who've been overseas, and the one thing they want to know is when do they get home? Sure, just as in the last war. Even our letters from Jim are full of it. Oh, soldiers in every war have wanted to go home. Certainly, if you want an example of human nature, that's one, to want to go home. But there's a, there's a big difference in this war. Oh, you hear of men wanting to come home, sure, but you don't hear of any desertions on account of it, as you did in other wars. The American soldier knows he's got to win before he gets home, or else his home won't be worth coming back to. So what's that got to do with the Tehran Conference? What's that got to do with it? Yeah. Everything. What do you suppose our men are fighting for, anyway? Oh, ideals, I suppose. Oh, it's chicken and every hot and dot pot. Mm, that's a fine idea for a young American. Oh. Look, we're fighting to get it over with, and that's all. Look, I don't begin to understand your attitude about idealism. You, you and your father seem to think that it's a little embarrassing to be found dead or alive with an ideal. Sure, sure, the terror and uh, agreement's visionary. But so was our Declaration of Independence. Did you ever stop to think of that? Supposing they sat around at Philadelphia 150 years ago making cracks about long hairs and visionaries. But that's different. The Declaration of Independence involved one country in 1776 and a terror thing involved oh, a bunch of countries in another time. Of you. What? We were practically 13 separate countries back in 1776. Where's your history? Well, I know. I right. hear certain people speak about the ideology of this war as though it was something extra. Uh, something you could throw away, uh, dispense with, if the going gets tough. Well, I think it's a heck of a lot more important than C rations or K rations or sometimes even ammunition. It's the whole heart and soul of fighting. And I've talked to a lot of G.I.s, too, and in my experience, it's hardly ever the men who do the fighting who sneer at the reasons why they're fighting. Yes, and the ones who sneer are mostly high-priced columnists who spend the rest of their time kicking about the income tax they have to pay. Sure. The only time the war comes home to them... Is when they get bounced off a plane because they don't have a priority. Mm. Uh, what papers do you read, Bill? Yeah, the same papers you read, sir. And I don't have to read the editorials to form my opinion. Just the main headlines and the text of the speeches and the communiques. I've been doing that right along. So have I, ever since Spain. Well, with me ever since Venture. Yeah. Well, that's all very well. And I still say the men are fighting to get back to where we were before the stinking war. That's all they're fighting for. I think that's enough to fight for. We're not mad at anybody. Well, <laughs> look, Ed, well, neither of us is on this lead to spend our time arguing. All I can say personally is that if I'm going to die in this war, I'd like it to be for an ideal. 
for something, something pretty awful special. And I think the promise of Terahan is, is that. I think the whole fact and the idea of the United Nations is something good and special. Now, wait a minute, Bill. Let's get back to where we were talking about, about the Declaration of Independence. Now, in the first We've place... never left it, Eddie. We've never left it. Tehran, the Charter, all these things, they're sort of the great-grandsons of stuff like the Declaration. Certainly. If a man writes a fine document 150 years ago, he's a hero, but if he writes it today, he's a politician. Believe me, when I leave my family this trip, it'll be for the duration, maybe for a good deal longer. And if I'm not coming back, at least I want my people to have an insurance policy on my life. And the best policy I know about so far is the one the Allies wrote there at Terra Hank. Yeah, yeah. And there's a captain in my company who talks like you, too, but nobody pays any attention to him either. Oh, Eddie, what a thing to say. I think you want to apologize to Joe. Oh, let's no, 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 no. <laughs> that's all right, Rita. Well, look, I've got to be getting along anyway, and that's as good a place as any to leave the discussion. Oh, now, hold on, Bill. You no, no, to... don't you go, Bill. Please stay and have some tea with no, us. No, no, come no, on. really, You're really. Sure, I, I are you? No, oh, no. Come but... on, come on, Bill. And stay. We really love you, you know. Only... I know. Even though we, we don't agree with you. Sure, Bill, I will. No, 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 no really. Look, look, I must go. I, I'm late now. I told Ed and I'd drop around now, so... Well, <sighs> good night, everybody. And I hope that before I go, we get a chance... Oh, George, look. Here comes the boy with your telegram from McCausland. Where? Why, he's right there, crossing the street. Oh, it's about time he let me know. Nearly a whole day to late with that thing. George W. Eakins live here? Yeah. Telegram for you. Oh, I see. I'm there. Okay. Here you are. Thanks. The trip isn't getting me those reservations. I'm just going to... Look, it's all right. Well, what's he say? Personal oh, What is it, Pa? What's the matter, George? Here, yeah, give it to me. The War Department regrets to inform you that your son, James Trish Egans, is missing. But he's a meteorologist. Well, how can he be missing? He's stationed in England. That, that can't be right. There must be a mistake here. Maybe it's the wrong... Jim... But it just says missing. Lots of guys who are missing later. I, I'm going inside. Excuse me, everybody. I'm going inside. Yeah, yeah. Let me help you, mother. I'm sorry, Eddie. Believe me, I'm sorry. And oh, Jim's all right. He's missing, that's all. Lots of guys who are missing later turn up. Don't they, Bill? Don't they turn up later? Sure, Eddie. Lots of them. Sure. Jim isn't dead, I know that. You can't kill a guy like Jim. He'll turn up. Of course he will. Sure. You're here with us right now, Bill. Can you stay for a little while? Yes, do stay, Bill. Of course. Bill, I... Come in the house. Come on in. I'll make something to drink for you. Many families held their breath that autumn and winter, waiting with hope that those overseas fighting in both Europe and the Pacific theater would return.